Each year, the Royal Society of Biology Charter Lecture focuses on someone in the East Midlands who has made a significant impact on the biological field. Melanie is certainly qualified. She's the director of the Leicester NIHR Biomedical um, Research Centre, which is, I'm sure she'll tell you herself, has recently come into some money, um, and is a professor in diabetes medicine. She's been here in Leicester almost all her career. She was awarded a CBE in 2016 for services to diabetes research. I'm sure you will want to welcome Melanie Davis as she gives the 2022 Charter Lecture, 100 Years of Insight. So, so thank you very much. It's uh, very lovely to see you this evening and I uh, am very grateful for the invitation. I'm going to review the last 100 years. I'm going to do it very much from a clinician's perspective in terms of what uh, 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 and go through the decades, but look at it in terms of the impact on the person living with type 1 diabetes. So before insulin was discovered, um, for millennia, right up until the early part of the 20th century, a diagnosis of diabetes was a death sentence, essentially. It was devastating, particularly in childhood, when it was usually fatal over a period uh, of weeks to months. And it's probably important to, to look back, and, and if you look at the role of the pancreas, even in the 1880s to 1890s, there was some understanding then, there was a discovery by Joseph N. Mering and Oscar Minkowski, who, um, after conducting experiments removing the pancreas from dogs, found that animals developed the same signs and symptoms of, of diabetes. And then our journey really actually comes back to uh, the UK when later experiments uh, narrowed the, uh, the search to the islets of Langerhans. And in 1910, Sir Edward Albert Shalfie Schaefer just suggested that one chemical was missing from the pancreas in people with diabetes. And he called this uh, chemical insulin, which comes from the Latin word meaning insula or islands. And that was in uh, 1910. And it's probably just worth sort of reorientating ourselves in terms of what was what was happening in the 1920s. And in 1920s, there were already traffic lights, there were vacuum cleaners, there was the television, so people were able to watch the telly, and there was quick frozen food, um, but there was no insulin. And, you know, in terms of the treatment for type, uh, type 1 diabetes in 1920, Really, it was a starvation diet that was really pretty much the only treatment. So people with type 1 diabetes were often kept in hospital for weeks or months at a time. Uh, their calorie intake and glucose excretion was meticulously uh, monitored. The degree of calorie restriction had to be carefully monitored owing to the uh, negative impact on growth and the ability of, of patients to fight off infections. And it was pretty awful. It was an unpleasant regime and it was very difficult to maintain. And it was pretty devastating for the individual, but also for their, for their family. And then the paradigm shift uh, happened in Canada. So in Canada, uh, in, October 19, uh, in October the 31st in 1920, uh, the insulin story began in London, not U uh, London, UK, London, Ontario, where Dr. Frederick Banting woke up in the middle of the night. He describes in his book at waking at two o'clock in the morning, he'd read an article about the pancreas and diabetes for a, a lecture he was preparing. And he was struck with an idea for an experiment to isolate the internal secretion from the pancreas that might control diabetes. And he actually noted it in his uh, notebook. And I was really privileged, actually, um, to meet Michael Bliss, who wrote the book, The Discovery of Insulin, but also to visit uh, the library in uh, Toronto, where uh, a lot of these um, documents are still kept. And he wrote in his uh, book, uh, 
ligate pancreatic ducts of dogs, keep the dogs alive until the asinine degenerate, leaving islets, and try to isolate the internal secretion. And essentially, that's he, he went with his idea, so he took his idea to the University of Toronto. He presented it to J.J.R. McLeod, who's a professor of physiology. McLeod was pretty skeptical, but he gave Bunting a small lab in the medical building, access to experimental dogs, a hundred dollar budget, which is a lot probably in 1920, but critically the assistance of a recent graduate in physiology and biochemistry, Charles Beth. And the story of Bunting and Best is a, a very famous one, but during uh, the summer of 1921, uh, they reported encouraging results with the extract, where, as you can see on the chart, they were able to administer uh, the extract and reduce uh, glucose levels in these depancreatized dogs. And they were joined, and in most great science, it's a team effort, and they were joined by Bertram Collop, who was a biochemist from Alberta, who happened to be on sabbatical, and again, it's teamwork, but it's usually a, for, a slight fortune as well, uh, uh, sometimes in these great discoveries. And he joined the team and uh, helped Bunting and Best to. So basically, then we move from animals to humans, and the first person uh, in the world to receive uh, insulin, as it was called then, was a 14-year-old boy called Leonard Thompson. And he received it on January the 11th, but it didn't really have much effect. Uh, but they worked with Colip and they were able to purify the extract. And on January the 23rd, um, Leonard Thompson uh, received insulin, which had a uh, lowering of blood glucose. And, you know, as I said, this was just a, a modern miracle at the time of medicine. The challenge then was to move to large scale insulin production because this news spread uh, pretty quickly. Um, but, um, and during the spring of uh, 1922, after some failures, production uh, was restored um, and Best oversaw that. And quickly this story uh, attracted international attention such that um, they received the Nobel Prize for Medicine in October 1923. Uh, it was quite controversial at the time, as most um, relationships with uh, academics are, in that Banting shared his award, because it uh, originally went to Banting and Best, but Banting shared his award with McLeod, and, um, uh, um, and also uh, they shared with Collip, who was the biochemist. Then after that, it was important to make this absolutely life-saving medicine available. And so the University of Tor Toronto uh, quickly oversaw uh, quality control and rights to North America. So that was held by Connaught and Eli Lilly, which still is a major player in insulin production uh, today. Um, if you look across the rest of the world, it was the MRC, for example, that first prepared insulin in the UK in 1923 uh, through uh, what's now become the Welcome. Uh, Novo Nordisk uh, so, uh, also obtained rights in Scandinavia in 1923, Hertz in Germany, and then across the Commonwealth the Government of, of Australia. So you can see how quickly now, if you think of, of now in terms of medicines going from phase one into availability for patients, it takes decades, yet within a few months, um, insulin production was formed across the world. So this is Elliot P. Jocelyn, who is a, was a very wise physician. And back in 1923, he said, insulin is primarily a remedy for the wise um, and not for the foolish, be they patients or doctors. I don't think it's a particularly politically correct statement, but it's very true. If we want people to use insulin well, uh, we need to really support them because um, it, 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 in order to live long with diabetes, you know how we must know how to use it successfully. Some examples, really. So pretty early on, it was recognised that insulin does not cure diabetes. It needed to be injected fairly regularly. Um, and it needed quite a lot of adjustment around diet. 
Um, in fact, actually very early on, there were major fears about the challenges of people self-managing uh, their um, treatment. Now, today our philosophy is very much that we support people to self-manage their long-term condition. Um, but here there was a real um, uh, barriers put up by physicians to want to, um, to underestimate really the ability of people to manage uh, their insulin. So many of the teaching hospitals wanted to manage that within the hospital. There was not much experience. The experience was very variable of people uh, living with diabetes. And much of the press were very skeptical that insulin should be administered by patients themselves. And if you look at the burden on a person, so this is a little infographic and you can see that there's a little teardrop to set a blood drop to say you have to measure your glucose. You then have to count your carbohydrate, you need to, to, to inject. And for many people in the 1920s and 30s, uh, insulin was associated with hypoglycemia. So this was quite a burden on, on people on, in their day. Now in the 1930s, We've got sliced bread, the uh, nylon bristle toothbrush, uh, the car radio, adhesive tape. What was happening with insulin? We'd now moved to mass production of insulin in the 20s and the beginning of the 1930s. Herx was one of the first companies to really uh, upscale and produce insulin of a, a consistent quality. And in the 1930s, there was a new crystalline insulin formulations, which uh, able to enhance purification and tolerability. And the first generation insulins uh, were fairly quick acting, so there was quite a lot of focus on trying to prolong the action of insulin. So this was either with oil suspensions, cholesterol, vasoconstrictor sub, uh, substances. But the experience still wasn't that great for, for the person living with diabetes. The injections were painful, the stability of insulin was poor and the variability was very uh, marked. So in the uh, 40s, you've got the color telly, uh, aerosol spray cans, uh, kidney dialysis, so fairly advanced in terms of insulin now um, uh, was produced largely from either cattle or pigs um, because some patients initially it was uh, often bovine insulin. Uh, many patients, however, did get allergic reactions to the bovine products and became uh, resistant, often because of antibodies. And so there was um, advances in the purification methods to try and uh, improve insulin. In the 50s, you've got the microchip now, uh, barcodes, the credit cards, and I'm not sure it's such a great invention, but the McDonald's, um, the first McDonald's was opened in the 1950s, and the first diet soft drink um, as well. Now there was improved purity of insulin, um, and there were what we call the combi insulins, where you were able to protract the action of insulin, and there were quicker acting insulins, and longer acting insulins, although the peak effectiveness was still some hours. Um, you know, if you think about how you'd like insulin to work after you uh, eat a meal, you don't, you don't really want something that's going to peak two or three hours after you've eaten. And so I think the next uh, advance really was trying to develop what we call the second generation insulin, which were complexing insulins with, uh, for example, zinc or cobalt. Um, the basic protein, so protamine uh, insulin, neutral protamine hapadorn or HPA, uh, NPH, is an insulin we still use in the clinic today. Um, and uh, uh, then there was the first quicker acting insulin, Rapitard. So the 60s is lots of good things happened in the 60s. I was born in the 60s. But in terms of uh, diabetes and insulin, not really a lot changed during the 1960s. So you've got the computer, the handheld computer, Valium. Um, in terms of the treatment of eye complications of diabetes, because now we've got people living longer with type 1 diabetes, they may have developed, um, for example, complications of diabetes. And so we have uh, the uh, management, for example, of retinal disease, 
changed in terms of the insulins um, in that decade. Now, by 1970s, we've now got email, um, floppy disk, mobile phone, uh, MRI, and we've got, I suppose, in the 70s is when you really get the semi-synthetic human insulin and, uh, and human insulin derived from recombinant DNA. Because by the 1970s, it's a bit like the discussion around oil, uh, by the 1970s, we'd realised that the worldwide demand for insulin was going to exceed natural uh, resources by the year 2000. And so semi-synthetic versions of human insulin uh, were launched in the mid-1970s. The first insulin pump was in 1976. They're a bit like the old mobile phones. They were very big and unwieldy to start with. They're unrecognisable now in the clinic. Uh, but these uh, came in in the 1970s. And so if you look at the sort of uh, um, the graphic below, you can see that the burden on the patient is still quite high. We're still needing to inject fairly regularly, but in terms of the risk of hypoglycemia, um, it's much less. And so these insulins are improving people's quality of life, but they're still people living with the disease. By the 1980s, uh, really the whole uh, biosynthesis process had evolved so we could produce human insulin using genetically modified microorganisms. Um, the limitations of NPH insulin were, you know, the older insulins you had to resuspend. And if you look at the graphic, you can see depending on whether you put the pen up, the pen down, or you mix the insulin, hugely impacted on uh, the action of insulin and its impact on glucose. So, you know, we had to be meticulous in telling people to resuspend their insulin, um, and it was really quite a faff for patients, but it could have a huge impact on their daily daily glucose control. And this is uh, a paper that we wrote recently uh, to celebrate the 100 years of insulin. And this is a colleague from the US um, who remembers on her ward rounds um, and when she talks about the vets, it's the veterans um, on the metabolic ward where they would uh, test their blood glucose level. Um, drop the blood on a strip, wait for it, match it to the right colour to measure the glucose level, and then they would send them round uh, for a walk around the wards, eat their lunch, and then they would have to check them again and often treat them for hypoglycemia because their blood glucose levels uh, had And so the next major development was what we call the analog insulin. So. The first um, analogues for long-acting insulin were starting to be developed in the 1980s and really um, then started to come into benefit for patients. So in the 1990s, uh, even some of the younger uh, members of the audience will remember the 90s, hopefully. So we've got the internet, text messaging, so the PlayStation, Google. And you've got the first insulin pens. So if you look at the old glass insulin uh, syringe, which used to have to be used on, on multiple occasions, the pens make it much easier, particularly if you're a, a child with type 2 diabetes, having the insulin pens were much easier uh, to administer insulin, much kinder. But he also, um, in terms of stigma, you could carry your pen around with you at school or at work made it much easier to live with uh, diabetes on a day-to-day -day basis. So the development of the long-acting basal insulins um, is quite a nice story. So uh, there was, in the 1980s, it was really trying to change the isoelectric points. So these had uh, were more neutral, so glargine, for example. Then in the 1990s, the approach was uh, isolation of insulin with, with fatty acids to try and protect, uh, uh, protract um, and that, and now um, the approach is the approach is trying to be to find insulins that have a more physiological approach. So, for example, if we look at regular human insulin, this is the insulin action um, uh, after administration. You can see that the faster acting insulins peak much more quickly, and then um, uh, basically their um, uh, length of action is much shorter. So don't get the hypoglycemia later 
And now uh, we're in the uh, faster acting insulins. And we've now, um, uh, now we now talk about the ultra fast insulin. So these are insulins that you can give as you're eating. Um, before we used to have to inject 20 minutes before. So if we can get quicker acting insulins, these are much closer to what we need in somebody with type 1 diabetes uh, when they're eating their meal. Also has an impact in type 2 diabetes because if you get a quicker insulin action, uh, you also suppress hepatic glucose production early, which can also improve glucose control. So by the 2000s, we've got the iPod, Facebook, USB flash drives, the iPhone, the Human Genome Project. With insulin, we've now well established in the in the clinic. Um, uh, U100 um, uh, blood gene. So as you know, this was starting to be developed in the 80s, but really only came into routine clinical care uh, in the year 2000 and was a big step forward. We had a clear insulin, you didn't have to resuspend it. It had a 24 hour duration of action, so it could be given once a day. Um, to provide basal insulin cover in type 2 and for type 1 diabetes and it was available in uh, pen systems and you can see compared to the NPH which is the black it didn't peak and trough like NPH so it's much less likely to cause hypos for example. By 2010 we've got the smartwatch, drones, lab grown meat and 3D uh, bioprinting and we've got now uh, new approaches to uh, de developing long-acting insulin. So pegylation of insulin, these were the so-called hepatoselective insulins, which bond. OK, so we did the trials, but we've got quite nasty injection sites and we've got abnormalities in LFTs. So that sounded like a really smart approach to insulin uh, uh, development, but it didn't work. Um, and we had the slightly by accident finding that highly concentrated insulin glargine, so the U300, uh, actually uh, had a longer duration of action. We've also got the first of the, the, the real acylated insulin, which is an insulin called insulin Degladec, which after you inject it, um, forms uh, essentially uh, multi-hexamers, which assemble and protract its action, so it only has to be given uh, once a day. This is U300 glargine, which essentially is quite a, a simple concept, really, and was slightly discovered by accident that if you gave the super concentrated insulin, which we tended in people with type 2 diabetes, you can end up with very high doses, and giving that in a single site can be quite painful for patients and quite uncomfortable. So, this was originally concentrated just to make it um, a, a smaller concentration for people to give but actually also results in a, a protracted duration. So just want to sort of bring to where we are now, and I want you to remember where we were in the 1920s, and things, like most things with technology, they really accelerate. And so much of the, what I'm going to talk to you about now is really in the last two years um, in terms of the technological revolution. So we've gone from apps and connected pens to the glucose sensor. So you may have seen on television some of the adverts for something called Freestyle Libra. You may have seen pictures of when Theresa May was the uh, Prime Minister of a little patch that was on her arm. And this is uh, what we call flash monitoring. So this is continuous uh, glucose monitoring that is uh, possible uh, with a, a small uh, sensor that sits on your arm. Uh, the insulin pumps have also uh, completely transformed. So now when we're in the 2020s, we're in the, the realm of the COVID vaccines, the record-breaking running shoes, very relevant to this, the Zoom burnout and the cap filters that inadvertently get applied to um, people in meetings. And uh, in terms of now, the technology that's available in people living with type 1 and type 2, now in the UK, our NHS reimburses pretty much for most people living with type 1 diabetes now, uh, the, the Freestyle Libre, 
Uh, we have evidence to show that that helps to reduce admissions to hospital and, and um, severe hypos in people living with diabetes. It's not easy. Technology also is a burden for some people. You have to scan fairly uh, regularly. For some people, it's quite an intrusion. They're never, never free from their diabetes because it's a constant uh, monitoring and reminder. And for some people, that can be very empowering. For other people, it can be a, a burden. But we do have uh, now, uh, we've gone from having uh, regular finger pricks of patients and, and injecting very frequently for insulin to now this ability to monitor either with the flash monitors or with continuous glucose monitoring. We can now start to link that to what we call CSI, CSII, which are the insulin pumps. And we now are almost at the stage where we have the artificial pancreas. So we have sensor augmented pumps and these hybrid closed loop systems. Um, and that is, we're moving now to uh, almost um, the full closed loop where we are also looking at, for example, glucagon and And this is what I would commonly see now in the clinic. In a, if I'm doing a diabetes clinic and I see a person with type one diabetes, we see now what we call these ambulatory glucose profiles. We can look at time and range. And if you apply just the technology of regular insulin and uh, some of this technology, you can get people around 30% of their time in range. If you add um, good structured self-management education and you add carb counting and um, really balancing the, the, the meal insulin and the background insulin, you can get that up to 50%. If you add insulin pump therapy, you might be able to get that to 59%. If you move now towards what's called the um, uh, hybrid closed loop system, which we're doing trials on in our clinic um, in Leicester and, and is moving rapidly into this, you can get probably patients to uh, 70 to 80 percent time and range. So it's been a massive um, uh, step forward in terms of what is um, uh, now available. The guidelines now increasingly suggest that the majority of people living with type 1 diabetes should be accessing uh, this technology. We're not quite there yet in the NHS, but we are moving reasonably quickly um, in that direction. And the technology is great, but it's also all of the psychological support that we need to put in place to help people take the best advantage of now uh, the technology that we have um, in our hands. So if you look at the bottom now, you know, it is possible now with continuous glucose monitoring and insulin pumps to really reduce, I mean, there's still a burden on people, but it, it, it is possible now to make that much easier for people to do pretty much um, uh, a liver, a, 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 a full life and to do most of the activities that they would do. But it's still a big challenge. And if you look at the variation in mortality um, of people diagnosed between the age of 40, and this looks across the world, and you can see that if, you, if you're in Iceland in some of the Scandinavian countries, the outcomes from type 1 diabetes are remarkable. People um, have uh, you know, very uh, low and not that different um, outcomes to people without type 1 diabetes. Uh, without type 1 diabetes. If you're unfortunate to live in the Democratic Republic of Congo, your standardised mortality ratio is nearly 40 um, compared to people with that. If we're able to give comprehensive care, which we see in high income countries, not the, the absolute end of the spectrum I showed you with the really use of technology to everyone in the clinic, but reasonable good clinic care, the standardised mortality ratio of somebody with type 1 diabetes in a high income country is about two and a half times people without diabetes. However, if you look, live in a low income country, it's nearly 35 to 40 times. And 84% of those deaths would be preventable, just even if we were able to do the basics right, i.e. reasonable human insulin, 
tools for people to monitor their glucose and regular A1C and complication screening. And it's pretty sad that in this day and age, where we have all this technology, and insulin was discovered 100 years ago, but unfortunately still in large parts of the world, that hasn't happened. And indeed, uh, some of the complications of diabetes, which take 10, 20, 30 years to develop, haven't really uh, gone down in recent times. I hope that we'll start to see that now, um, but really up until uh, fairly recent times, that hadn't really shifted cost of insulin varies hugely. Actually, uh, US is almost like a third world country when it comes to access to insulin. It's uh, very expensive in the US and many people who are not on insurance plans or come from uh, more deprived parts of the community have probably uh, as poor outcomes as some of the um, developing world. And you can see that in the UK we're not too bad in terms of the cost of it varies hugely and, you know, it's interesting, uh, costs um, around $7 per unit of insulin, um, whereas it's uh, more than uh, almost 12, 15 times that in, in the US. So since the discovery of insulin, the life of people living with type 1 diabetes have been completely transformed. The, the change, pace of change has really accelerated even in the last five years. It's completely different in the clinic now, sitting there now, than even it was two or three years ago. But despite these uh, advances, uh, there remains on a global level. And this was when, this is a reflection that I had back in the 1980s when I was a junior house doctor working um, in type 1 diabetes. And I remember, you know, you always remember particular uh, patients and a, a young lady with type 1 diabetes who was completely burnt out, frustrated, no technical support, no psychological support, and how far we've come really from that time. And it has been transforming. And I think this is a really nice, this is um, a picture of James Haven, who was the first person in the US uh, to receive insulin and was at the point of death, actually, when he uh, received insulin uh, back in uh, 1923. And painting that hangs in one of the galleries in the US um, that he painted, and he went on to live and into, into his 50s or 60s and was a very successful artist. And it just shows how that discovery uh, completely transformed people's lives. Thank you very much for your attention.